to go to Children's Church. So as we are continuing in the book of Habakkuk, we come to chapter 3. It is, it's an amazing turn. And as we get into it, I'm left with questions that are at the top of your notes. If you don't have a program, how can you know who the players are? So grab a, a copy of, of the notes. If you didn't get one, you're free to go get one right now. If you look at the top of that sheet, it asks real questions. We need to ask real questions like, is this Christian faith big enough to handle what life brings? Like, what do we do? How do we deal with, as we look around this life and see the horror that it is, seeing so much that troubles our hearts? When we look into our communities, our families, our neighborhoods, they're walking around carrying so much. Maybe you came in this morning and the backpack of your life is so heavy you staggered in, barely able to make it through the door. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with the fact that it seems like in our community, in our life, sin is celebrated. Is it not? Almost, or at least tolerated, at the very least. What do we do with that as a Christian who loves Jesus and reads their Bibles and says, wait a minute, there's got to be, it's, it's better than this, right? And as we, I want us to get into the mindset of Habakkuk, because what Habakkuk is sharing is exactly living what we're experiencing and living today. It's incredible to me that as we look at Habakkuk, written over 2,500 years ago, from this moment we're sitting in, and it's ex absolutely relevant to our lives today. Those questions, I mean, I, I battle with my own heart and the evil I carry around in my life and the struggles that I have Knowing that Jesus has redeemed me and how this stuff, this flesh, wars against what Jesus is doing in my life. How do we deal with that struggle, amen? Isn't that a good question to ask? And as we are going to see today, when Habakkuk is confronted with all of these terrible things that he's seeing... We'll see today that his answer is, God, you have to save, or we're lost. Now, if you look at your notes, you'll see that I want you to leave with one thing, and that's the key idea. If you remember other things, that's gravy. But if we were to take Habakkuk's cry that he starts to cry out in the Lord in chapter 3 and pull it into our time, it's the key idea, Jesus my only hope is you. That is a truth that's bigger than our circumstances, amen? That is a firm foundation that tells a bigger truth than the one we're experiencing, the difficulty and pain. If you have your Bible, I'd, I'd ask that you could hold that in one hand, but then you'll see in front of you the pew Bible. I want you to open your pew Bible I know you've probably got a device or your own Bible, but I want you to look at the piece that says, hey God, are you seeing all this? Are you even paying attention? Do something about it. And if I were to put it in, in modern vernacular as he's praying these things in verses 1 through 4 as he says, the wicked, man, there's violence everywhere. Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. God, are you seeing this? Are you going to do anything about it? And if he were a 2024 person, maybe you've prayed this, he's in effect, I think what's between the lines is he's saying, God, bring revival. Bring revival. Turn your people back to your ways and not their, their ways. 
And that's the beauty of lament. Habakkuk pours out his heart and tells God exactly as it is. And what do we do when our hearts are overwhelmed by this season we're living in? The fancy word for it is lament. It's why we're in Habakkuk. Why does it seem like evil's winning? Lord, I don't think you're listening or paying attention. Are you even there? That's the beauty of lament. That's the power of lament. We tell God exactly how we're feeling. He's big enough to handle it. He knows already, but he wants you to cry out to him. His shoulders can bear it. Don't, do you think you're saving God or sparing him of something by keeping exactly what your heart is saying? No. In fact, our relationship with God, Habakkuk shows us, gets even more authentic as we tell God what's going on in our lives, crying out to him. You see, because good little Christians do tell God exactly how they feel. This is a part of my journey, coming to Christ, telling me exactly what I think of him and how I felt about him. And he took it all. He absorbed it all and said, yes, I love you. And so Habakkuk says that, and then on the second section there, the first heading, the Lord's answer. The Lord answers Habakkuk. You know what that means? Habakkuk shut up and listened. You want to you take home for today? we got to shut up and listen after we talk to God. Because I don't know about you, but I love filling my prayer time and my time with the Lord with my voice. But then there's Habakkuk, and he, he listens to God. And he, God tells him something that he wasn't expecting. You know, hey, how, how are you going to bring revival? And uh, God says, by bringing in the Babylonians. Can, I mean, it's like, what? Wait a minute. The, the Babylonians. You don't think Habakkuk is freaked out by that? That he's not a little overwhelmed by that? Look at the next response by Habakkuk in that second column. Habakkuk's second complaint. His first one was four verses. Look how long the second complaint is. And he's like, wait, 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 what, what, what? Don't you know who these Babylonians are, God? What are you doing? In fact, he gets to the point where he's saying, God, I'm frustrated by you. If you see 2 verse 1, that's where his complaint, second complaint ends. It's like he's got his arms crossed. And he's on the roof and he's like, I'm going to stand watch and wait to hear from you, God, because I'm frustrated by your answer. He, he knows he's being a little petulant because how he finishes that sentence there at the very end of 2 verse 1, I know I have a rebuke coming. I'm going to wait and see how I need to answer your rebuke to me because I know I've been a little bit more, uh, I, I'm, I'm outside the comfort zone and I'm telling you exactly what I think of your plan, God. Do you really know what you're doing? And, and, and so he, he finishes that, I know re a rebuke's coming, I need to formulate my answer. And in fact, chapter 3 starts his answer. This is his answer. So he's got his arms crossed and he's on his roof and he's like, wait, and I'm, I'm up there, I'm waiting to hear from you, God. And then God answers him. And actually, like, it's almost the, this, this, the second response by God in verse 2 and following is that God sort of splits the curtain of reality and lets Habakkuk see into the, the mind of God and just how much in control God is. There's this massive world power known as the Babylonians. They're a vicious people. They are extremely powerful. <clears throat> in the second answer by God, God says, yeah, but I'm going to judge them. But I'm going to use them. I'll use the enemy for my purposes. That's how powerful I am. Amen. The, there is... A plan that's working that you can't see, Habakkuk, and you've got to trust me on this. And so he splits that open and shows Habakkuk exactly that. And in fact, the central 
Rick, thank you for sharing the word with us. Uh, you, you got the, the best verse in the whole book of Habakkuk, verse 4, that we can absolutely trust in who God is and how faithful he is. You know why? Because he is every step of the way faithful. And so as we come through this, this whole verse, verse 20 ends us right before we get into chapter 3. And God says, let me make sure you understand. I am in my temple and the whole world is going to remain silent. Because I am God. That is a truth that we can stand on. That leads us into this, the key idea. Jesus we in the New Testament, in this church at Cross Point, we confess that our only hope is you. And so this turn that uh, Habakkuk makes is incredible to me. So it begins on the lower right corner of uh, 807. And it starts, it says Habakkuk's prayer. And it starts with saying Habakkuk, the prophet. It's very interesting to me, this book of Habakkuk, because a lot of the prophets that we read in the Old Testament, it's God coming down to them and saying, I need you to be my messenger, and I have a message for my people, here's what it is. But this one isn't God speaking through man, it's man speaking to God. I mean, this is, this is different. It's important to note that because it's appropriate this is scripture we're reading, that we go to God with our concerns and how we think he's messing up. But now, Habakkuk the prophet, God told him in his last response, hey, write this all down, tell it to the people, they need to know this. And verse 3, 1, chapter 3, verse 1, starts the answer Habakkuk knew he would have to share when God rebuked him. And God rebukes him by showing him what his, he's at work doing. And his response is a very strange word that we don't even know what it means. Do you, does your Bible have it in there? It's like shigalot, shigalot, or what does that mean? We're not really sure, except that we can see where it shows up. It looks like every time it shows up, it means it's, it's a, a song of prayer. Margie, thank you for reading uh, Psalm 7. It was Psalm 7. If you flip in your Bible to Psalm 7 in your pew Bible, you can see that that funny word is there at the top of Psalm 7. That same word is there. It's actually, we think it's a musical term. And that this prayer that Habakkuk is uh, writing down, it's a song of praise to God. And so what that means is, from this point forward, I will be singing. And so will Dave as he, and Michael as he finishes. So you have to sing it. It's, we're, we're, we're in Les Mis now. It's a song of praise. If you have the New Living Translation, it actually translates this verse 1 as Habakkuk the prophet sung a praise prayer or something to that effect that, that Habakkuk was singing this. And you know what is great about singing truths about God? It moves it from our head to our heart. Worship. It's amazing. In fact, it's interesting to note that when Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, the wilderness, and now they're getting ready to enter the promised land, and God moves Moses in chapter 31, verse 19, to write down a song. It's actually a song of rebuke. This is all telling the people a song, and that's what basically the first 43 verses of chapter 32 of Deuteronomy is that song. Of, of praise, but it's all about how Israel is going to fall away and how God is going to have to do um, some things that he doesn't want to do. He's going to have to judge his people. 
He's letting them enter the promised land even though he knows what's coming. Our God is good. All the time. God is good. And so Habakkuk is doing the same thing as Moses did. He's writing this song. He wants to write this in a lyrical way according to Shigalot or Lot or I forget how to say it, but it's there. You can read it. It's Hebrew word and my Hebrew is a little rusty, but it's important to know that it's a song that we're supposed to sing of praise to God when faced with difficult truth, when faced with hard times. Because if you notice... Worship is always appropriate. It's the only response to hard times. When we don't know anything else to do, fall on your knees in praise. It's why lament works. Because we start to remember who God is. There's these hard situations in my life, and God, you are good. Those two things are true together at the same time. Look at Psalm 7. Doesn't it tell the same story? David's going, look at all of this trouble I am in, and I praise you, God. You are king and glory and sovereign. You are in control of my life. No matter what happens to me, I am in your hands. That is the result of lament. It's the result that comes out of a heart that's breaking in front of God's feet at his throne. And that's worship. It's interesting that worship is one of the things that continues on after the new heavens and the new earth. Right? This is what I'm talking about, and it means make a joyful noise. But then Habakkuk starts in Lord, verse 2, I have heard of your fame. Notice in your Bible, let me do a little teaching for you. The word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. You know what that means? The name of God he's using there? It's the covenant name. It's the name that God used to establish covenant with his people. Yahweh. That is the covenant name of God. That's the name we see over and over again in Habakkuk. And of course, as he... Habakkuk goes to sing praises to God. He's using that covenant name, Yahweh, ultimate state of being, the source of all life, the source of all truth, the source of all power, the source of all faithfulness. Verse 4 of chapter 2. God's faithfulness is the only reason that Habakkuk and you and I can draw another breath of confidence. It's because God is a God who is faithful. He always does what he said. And and Habakkuk says, look, I know of how you have worked in the past. I am a spectator of it. I have read your acts in the word. I have seen how you have moved. I have seen how you have taken and, and turned things around in people's lives and moved the world like it's a giant chessboard. Even when the world feels so out of control and everything is spinning in a different direction, I see your hand at work. It's in here. You know, I wish this church had a pastor who said, you know, you should really read your Bible. (laughs) Oh, wait, we do. Look down below. That's one of my so what's. Each one of us needs to get to know the word better. We'll get back to that. Including myself, guys. I just have so just scratched the surface. And Habakkuk uses this covenant name. He uses it very intentionally. He's showing his reverence for God. He said, I know in verse 1 of chapter 2 that I'm going to be rebuked and I'm going to answer you. And his answer is such a turn away from lament and complaining to God. And now he's praising God. And he uses the covenant name because that's a name he can stand on. Okay, we got it. Then he says... I know you, I have heard of your, your ways. I have heard of your fame. I know those things because even when I was a little kid, I listened to the stories. And I, and I know of your, your ways. And now I stand 
in awe of your deeds, Yahweh. So what is the only appropriate response? Awe. There's, there's awe-inspiring moment here. Their fear is, is wrapped into this word that's being used here. It's, it is being overwhelmed as we look at how God has worked. It's fearful. It's, it's, it's like he's, Habakkuk is quaking as he recounts all that God has done in his life. There is something incredibly powerful when you and I look in his word and recount all that God has done. It's a deeper truth that carries us through the difficult times when we're being shaken by the moments of our life when we just feel like evil is winning. We recount what God has done, and that's a deeper truth. That is more true, that is is more powerful a word than any circumstance we're in. See, that's how, that, that is not happiness, is it? That is not, I am, I am happy because of the great things going on in my life. No, despite the great things going on in my life, I have joy, which is founded in my belief in who God is and how he is going to accomplish his work in my life. And when he starts thinking about those things, he realizes that God has continually fulfilled his obligations time and time again. That the people, his chosen people, have been the ones who have walked away from him. God's saying, you feel far from me? Guess who moved? Not me. I'm right here. I'm waiting for you. You know what? I have a quick path back to me. Come on. You're never too far away. Never. The Lord can restore. Habakkuk's banking on it. It's exactly what he's saying here. I'm in awe. It freaks me out. I'm scared. I'm in overwhelmed moment when I think about all that you've done. But then he says, repeat it in our day. Second main section. We can always rely on God to act on our behalf. We can always Rely on God. We can rely on God to always act on our behalf. That's exactly where Habakkuk is in this moment. He's going, look, this, this is my only hope is you, God. You've got to do what you've always done. Repeat it in our day. He's praying for, well, I think he's actually praying for the time between when uh, Babylon finally, they're sweeping in. They're, they're coming in. They're an irresistible force. They're coming. He's been told that God, God is using them for his purposes to judge Israel. And Israel has nobody to blame but themselves. Victim mentality doesn't work here with God. You know, it just doesn't. And so Habakkuk is praying for the time between that moment, which is scaring him, that truth is scary, and when God judges Babylon... And restores his people. He's saying, do that thing you do that I've seen you do time and time again in in our time, in this moment that is overwhelming. God, please work in this new situation that's coming. And can you can you imagine having God come to you and and just sort of opening your eyes to what's coming? And it's really scary and it's overwhelming, and there's a big bad force coming, and it's it's gonna be. We're, we're, we're going to be leaving the promised land. We're being pulled away from everything we've ever known. But the problem is, is that if you look back to Genesis 3 and the curses, this is totally free, I'm not charging extra for this. The only thing that breaks through our sin and self-centeredness is suffering. And so this is not punitive by God to bring his judgment. It's restorative. Have you ever thought about that? God is allowing difficulty to wake us up, to get our attention. Does that that minimize the difficulties we're going through? No. But when we step back and we take a 10,000 foot view and go, wait, what's going on here? Is there something in this suffering that God is trying to tell me? 
Suddenly, I'm more aware that I need Jesus, and my only hope is Jesus. I can't feel self-sufficient anymore. Genesis 3, the curse is God's letting sin work its way in us so that he can be glorified and he can have us turn to him. And so if you're going through, I want to give you hope about this. This is a positive message that the suffering and the difficulty that you're going through is something that God can use for his glory in your life. And Habakkuk knows that. He turns and says, God, in your wrath, remember mercy and so this wrath that he's this awful terrible shaky time i mean this truth is too much it scares the living daylights out of me that word wrath it has this sense of restorative justice that i've been talking about it's like oh it is a time of turmoil that is coming but it has a purpose it's not random it's not chaotic it's purposeful habakkuk is going in this very structured and purposeful thing you're doing. Remember your covenant love as a father for us. That's mercy. That compassion, think compassion, that's, that's the term here that Habakkuk is absolutely standing on as a truth. This is ground that he's able to stand on when it feels like everything else is shaking. That he can cry out to a God and have expectation that in God's wrath that he is bringing, he will be compassionate. Because he's seeing and saying, God, what you do in our lives is not punitive, it is restorative. I think it's the same, like if you're at the men's retreat, these passages are going to seem familiar to you. Because... God is the same compassionate God here in the Old Testament that Habakkuk is relying on that we see in the New Testament. When we look at Mark chapter 10, verse 46, and we see where Jesus heals the blind Bartimaeus. God has showing compassion to this blind man, changing his destiny, both physically by being able to see, but then opening his spiritual eyes. We see it in Matthew 10, 19 and following, where the woman touches his garment and is healed. And that's on his way to healing the official's daughter. I mean, what a journey he's on there. And the compassion that God, Jesus is saying, he says, she's not, th- this story is not done being told. She's just asleep. She's only dead. Death is nothing for me. I can heal that. Ultimately, Jesus is coming back and he's going to heal death. We'll never taste death twice, just once. That is the same compassion that Habakkuk is relying on. The same mercy that he's speaking of there is the same mercy you and I can receive and live and believe in right now. How about in Matthew 9, verse 36, when Jesus looks over the city and proclaims that they're like sheep without a shepherd, this compassionate moment when Jesus looks over the crowd of people and and longs for them to know him as their shepherd. That's still true today. It's Luke Luke 23, uh, verse 34. Father, forgive them. You know what's coming. For they... They don't, they don't know what they're doing. He's hanging on the cross. He's dying for the sins, past, present, and future. And the compassionate heart of God is flowing with compassion. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You talk about mercy and compassion. We can rely on that truth in the midst of difficulty. It's a bigger truth than the suffering you're feeling right now. And so what? If you look, I always end with so what? You know, we could talk about this. Hey, isn't Habakkuk 3 verses 1 and 2 in that change? How Habakkuk's gone from complaining to God to saying, okay, I get it. I praise you. You're amazing. I can rely on you. You're faithful. I can, I can have a faith that's based in your faithfulness. Yahweh is the covenant God. He's going to do what he says. He does it every time. He, he Habakkuk knows that God has done his, Habakkuk's part even. 
Jesus did that, came to earth, stepped into our place, took our, our sin on his shoulders and did our part, died for our sins. He did that. So if we think all of that, but we don't do anything with it, if we don't integrate this into our life and walk out of here with that truth and do something with it, what good is it? That's why I say, so what? So what big deal? Well, the first so what big deal is we have to know God's word better. Did I say that before a little bit earlier? If only this church, yeah, I said that. However well you know scripture, you need to know it better. So that when you don't have a Bible with you and you're confronted with some difficulty, the Holy Spirit uses stuff that you've memorized, that you've meditated on in your life in a way that blesses beyond measure. There's a reason why Pastor Dave asks us to be in our Bibles. Because you're, you're treasuring away good stuff that can pour out of your life when you need it the most. It helps us recount how God has worked in the past in people's lives. We read God's story as he's told it in other people's lives. It moves us into an eternal perspective of this moment that I'm walking. It it, it removes us from thinking too highly of ourselves. It it points us in the right direction, and that is praying that God would would come quickly. And that, that I need to share this good news with other people that you would pour it into other people. Second, so what? We must ask ourselves, how can we worship in this moment? You don't think that's a good question to ask when you're overwhelmed? Okay, okay, God, I need, to, I need to catch a breath here. How can I possibly worship in this moment? Even though it seems like the least appropriate response to the suffering that I'm experiencing right now. We're going to have a testimony that's coming here pretty soon that's going to recount suffering and how how do you persevere with layer upon layer upon layer of suffering and i i you need to hear this testimony have you written down the third one have you written down how god has worked in your life Count the times that God's looked out for you and and as we read in Romans that the Holy Spirit has intervened for you in ways you didn't even know. Groans too deep for words. It's the same as Jesus when he's praying for the disciples when he tells them, hey look, I've been praying for you because the devil asked for your lives. I'm upholding you and you don't even know it. Write those things down because you know what it does? It doesn't, it, it takes it from This is God's story in other people's lives, and it puts you and I into this book. God is telling his story to this day, and we are in that story that this recounts. He's telling a new story in your life because of who Jesus is. And if you sit down and start going, wait a minute, God, how and where have you worked in my life, despite the fact that I am a chief knucklehead, you've done things in my life because of who you are not because of who I am. And that when you look at me, you see Jesus in my heart and not this flesh that wars against my heart. Honestly, I would have you today to to give yourself 20 minutes to just sit down and start recounting where has God worked in your life. And so I want to take a couple of minutes of your time to have a person come up here and share. Appropriately, it's Mother's Day, so I'm going to have my mother come up and share her testimony. Maybe you know her. She's uh, a leader here at this church and pretty cool cat. (laughs) We'll just stay up here. You know I'm the English teacher, so I had to write all of this down. This year, my husband Mike and I will celebrate our 61st anniversary. Based on the day of our wedding, I should have known many challenges were to come. That day, between two semesters of college, 
I was recovering from a throat infection. The temperature was 21 below zero with a foot of snow on the ground. The flowers froze going into the church. The ceremony was over an hour late waiting for the best man to arrive from Chicago. The, pro the pipes froze and burst in our hotel that night, which meant no heat and escaping water that caused our empty car to slide down the hill, stopping just short of the swimming pool. It has been quite a ride. In 1982, my husband was the victim of a serious motorcycle accident when someone made a left-hand turn from the right-hand lane in front of him. He landed well beyond the intersection, critically wounded, but still alive. That night, as they were operating on his crushed leg, his heart stopped. God brought in a thoracic surgeon who found the bleeder and saved his life. I was in the waiting room that night, praying for God's hand of protection during those eight hours of surgery. I was feeling anxious, worried, struggling for hope. The Lord called me to walk down the hallway to a window. The bright stars against the black canopy began to touch me deep in my soul, and hope grew inside. At that moment, I was reminded that whatever came, God was in control. What followed were two months in the hospital, 13 surgeries, and two years of recovery. During those tough times, I saw our teen son head up our family. He says that was a turning point in his life, in his faith. My fellow teachers provided evening meals, and friends and family stepped in to help wherever needed. So many people became the hands and feet of Jesus in helping us through. Sometimes there were dark days, but it was the Lord and his promise of hope that got me through. Not might, maybe, could, should, may, perhaps, but would fill me with hope, and he did. Just five years later, in 1987, Mike had his retirement fund stolen by a good friend who took the money and his family and left the state. They were among our dearest Christian friends, and we were devastated. As we searched for answers to how this could happen, those were times of testing. We were angry, hurt, scared about our future, so we hired a lawyer, an investigator, to find and confront him about his betrayal. However, the Lord was working on our hearts regarding forgiveness. We kept hearing the Lord telling us to forgive if we wanted him to forgive us. I think my biggest question was, if we can't trust our fellow Christians, whom can we trust? The answer, of course, is God. Eventually, we found him, but we worked out a deal with the local prosecutor where our friend could pay back the money over time and avoid a jail sentence. Later, we learned that he and his family had lived on our money for a year as he suffered from depression and she from a serious illness. Eventually, the Lord told us to cancel the remainder of the debt, trusting him to provide, and he did, and he has. In the fall of 1992, Mike was diagnosed with stage 3B colon cancer, which resulted in surgery for a colon resection and a permanent colostomy. With chemotherapy and radiation to come, his prospects were recovery for good, and we were thanking God for his provision. He was soon discharged from the hospital. Days later, the ostomy site failed, so he underwent another surgery. During this second surgery, his colon twisted. Because it was lying on top of a major artery, it had to untwist on its own. Family, friends, and churches prayed specifically for that colon to straighten as he remained in the hospital. Doctors gave him a 10% chance of survival. This went on for nearly two months, and Mike asked me to bring his cowboy boots. He said if he died, he would be wearing his boots. <laughs> that nearly put me down. We were praying for healing, but we knew that might not be part of God's plan. I was asking, Lord, our kids are grown and gone, and I've just begun a new school year. How will I keep up? The Lord reminded me that waiting means choosing, choosing to trust him, refusing, refusing to hear the voice of the enemy. My hope during that time came not from a guarantee of healing, but from my relationship with the Lord, knowing that he would always be with me, 
regardless of the outcome. Nearing the end of two months in the hospital, God answered our prayers, and his test showed that his colon had untwisted. Hallelujah. We knew the Lord was responsible. Six months of radiation and chemotherapy followed, and today he is cancer-free. God gets the glory for all of that. In 2001, the next challenge came. Are you seeing a pattern here? My husband's lifelong dream had been to open a small gun shop, so he took our savings and opened the store. For several years, he ran the store alone, but running a business by himself meant long hours and stressful days. One night, Mike stayed late in the store to finish paperwork. It was after, after 10 o'clock when I heard the garage door opening and then scraping on the side of the garage. Coming in, he picked up the TV remote, turned it backwards, and became agitated when it would not work. He responded to my questions with nonsense words. With my daughter's prompting, I called 911. My husband had had a stroke. Tests revealed a bleed in his left temple, but he quickly responded to treatment. What had we done to deserve this healing miracle? We knew the answer was nothing. We cannot earn his love and mercy. His greatest desire is that we would come to trust him in all things, not because of what he does or doesn't do, but because of who he is. Amazingly, the only discernible lasting effects were difficulties with judging time periods and choosing the right words to communicate. Thingamajig, whatchamacallit, and you know what I mean, became part of his everyday vocabulary. Later that year, my husband's greatest expression of love for me was the willingness to close his store and join me in retirement. He loved that shop, but he loved me more. Thank you, Lord, for your love and his. Mike's challenges seemed to come every five to ten years. So when 18 years passed, we were encouraged. Perhaps the greatest challenge to our faith, however, came in the year 2019. We were wintering in South Texas, and around midnight I heard him calling me. Hurrying downstairs, I saw that he had fallen to the floor. Drenched with sweat and trembling, he said, I've been here for an hour, and I can't get up. Our firefighter neighbor was able to get him into the recliner where he stayed for most of the next several days. He seemed to be getting better. Not normal, but better. In the spring, we returned to Rockford and put the incident behind us. In retrospect, that was not a good thing. What came next was a chain of events orchestrated by God to save his life. In July, my husband went to see a new foot doctor who was going to do surgery to treat his multi-year foot wound. First, he needed a stent placed in a right thigh blockage to improve the blood flow. So we went to a cardiologist. An EKG revealed that he had, a, had had a heart attack at some point. And looking back, we both knew where and when. The cardiologist performed an angiogram planning to do stents, but instead he prescribed a heart bypass. Three months later, Mike had a double bypass in Madison, Wisconsin, and we both were feeling anxious about his facing his 25th surgery. Our three children came, and we prayed through the wait. Praise God, the bypass was successful. Surgeries followed that next year for the thigh stent and his right foot, and he graduated from wheelchair to cane, since then, I have struggled as his wife. Am I caring for him properly? How much should I push him to do? When I do not wait on him every moment, am I being a godly wife? I pray, Lord, I need your wisdom to know how to best serve this man I love and still encourage his independence. Only my Savior can give me the wisdom and strength that I need. These days I ask, <clears throat> How do those who don't know the Lord get through the tough times? I just don't know. Then I ask, how long, Lord, can I keep going through times such as these? He answers, it's we. I am with you. Only through praying, studying his word, and growing relationship with Christ can we all persevere. Most times it's day by day, but sometimes it's hour by hour or minute by minute. In her book, Prayer That Works, Jill Briscoe says that we are to offer a sacrifice of praise. She urges, 
when you can't praise God for what he has allowed, you praise him for who he is. When life is not going well, our praise is a costly sacrifice. Look for the little things before the big things appear. One of the greatest helps for me is to look back and remember how faithful God has been in the past and how he has worked through my entire life. He has never failed me. The Lord has blessed me with my husband, Mike, and both of us with three precious children. Tom and his wife, Jeannie, whom you know. Barbara, who's watching online, and her husband, Eric, right over there. Tracy and her husband, David, She's singing in the choir today at First Free. I forgive her for that. <laughs> All of them know the Lord, and their lives share their faith. They, in turn, have blessed us with six grandchildren. I can see three of them right here, Hannah, Sadie, and Andrew. Thank you, Lord. I'll close with 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. So you see the fourth so what there is following that testimony, right? When God acts on our behalf, so often there are short-term consequences but long-term benefits. Just let that sink in. The horribleness that the, that the enemy would have us land in and believe, it's a bigger truth. The team can come out. I'm just talking. Worship team, come on up. But I think that we can cut and run because we have the hard times that are kind of hitting us. And my dad's the energizer bunny. He just keeps going and going and going. And what mom didn't tell you is that she had a cancer battle in the midst of all that. She's the most faithful woman I know. No offense, Jeannie. <laughs> so I'm asking you to ask this question, God, is there a larger picture you need me to see. I can't see it myself, Lord. Help me. I want you to do that as a, as a family of God. Let's l take the long view, trusting that God says exactly who he is, and we can trust that. Amen.